Welcome to the Wilson Center. Um, my name is Henri Baki. I'm the new director of the Middle East program here. And let me also welcome you to probably the only meeting in town today that's not on Iran. <laughs> Unless you want to talk about Iran today. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, so today our to uh, the topic is Jordan and the challenges of confronting I ISIS next door. And we have two very eminent uh, speakers. And uh, on my right is um, Anya Wilshok, who's, I hope I pronounced it correctly, um, is the head of the Amman office of the German uh, think tank, the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung. Um, I'm not gonna, uh, she's been working in, uh, in Jordan since 2012 and um, uh, is, uh, most of the work is involved in looking at political Islam and youth projects. And I'm not gonna spend too much time on, on bios because we all have, you, you must have seen the, the bios outs, uh, outside. And on my left is David Schenker, who's the Obsian, also another German uh, name, um, fellow and director for the program on Arab politics at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Previously, he served in the office of the Secretary of Defense as the Levant country director. So without much ado, um, I would like to welcome them both to the Wilson Center, and which is turning out to be my first event here. Um, so we'll have the speakers talk for each for about 10 minutes, and then I'll ask probably the first question, and I'll open up to, to, to you all. Thank you. Anya. Well, thank you very much, uh, Henri. I'm uh, very honored to be um, uh, invited to speak here today, and I'm very impressed by this turnout, especially with regard to uh, the recent Iran deal. Uh, I think you're all waiting to be briefed on this issue as well, so thank you very much for coming here to listen to us uh, talk about Jordan. It's excellent to be on the same panel with uh, David, who is a wonderful expert on, on Jordan. Um, as an intro, I would li like to give a brief outline on uh, what has happened in recent years uh, in Jordan, especially since uh, the uh, Arab Spring. Uh, in Jordan, we had a slight opening uh, of the country um, uh, in the course of the Arab Spring. There were protests, but on a much smaller scale than um, in uh, uh, many of the other countries in the region. Uh, there was a protest movement uh, called Herak, which uh, united uh, protesters from many different uh, sides. But um, uh, the turnout was fairly, uh, uh, fairly minimal. There were um, uh, a few reforms um, uh, done by the government, and um, uh, the government also adopted a very clever uh, strategy of co-optation. So um, uh, what we've um, uh, seen is that, that the movement has basically uh, died down. Um, this is also um, uh, due to the fact that Jordanians do follow um, the developments in the other countries very closely, especially in Egypt. And um, uh, many have um, uh, practiced self-restraint. Um, they have seen what has happened in Egypt, they have seen what happened in, in Libya, of course, uh, Syria and Iraq are neighboring countries, and many are aware of the special situation they have in Jordan. Um, it's safe, it's stable, and um, there is a, a little wish to um, uh, endanger this um, situation, despite, of course, many deficits that uh, citizens are observing in the country. So um, since uh, 2013, we've seen uh, a shift from this slight opening of um, uh, the country to a more and more dominant security logic. Henri has asked me to speak about um, how ISIS is seen in Jordan. Well, um, as uh, many of you who um, work in the Middle East have probably observed, um, conspiracy theories are, of course, <laughs> very um, uh, dominant in the uh, discourse. And so you have um, uh, many conspiracy theories about um, how ISIS was created. And um, this is not only uh, the general citizen talking. You even find them in academic circles. And um, they range from um, the West or the US creating ISIS um, as a tool to divide the Middle East from um, Iran creating ISIS to gain more influence, or um, uh, the Saudis um, uh, creating ISIS to diminish the influence of Iran. So um, it's, um, uh, it can be <laughs> tricky to, um, to lead um, an educated discourse on the topic. But um, uh, for a background, it is uh, critical to understand that um, uh, while um, the US is a very close ally um, uh, of Jordan, um, the um, population views it very critically, and this is uh, most recently due to the uh, invasion of um, Iraq, which was a, a 
to which um, uh, Jordan had very close ties, and you still find many uh, Ba'athists, many uh, um, Jordanians who've studied in Iraq who uh, um, have um, very close ties to the country. So this, um, uh, this is uh, uh, one of the large events which has caused a fair amount of um, criticism uh, towards the US, which is um, still um, uh, dominant in, uh, uh, in Jordanians' opinion towards the US. So you had um, a, a fair number of uh, Jordanian fighters in Iraq during um, uh, the evasion joining Al-Qaeda in Iraq. And um, you have uh, several uh, prominent um, extremist leaders uh, from Jordan, uh, leaders and preachers. For example, um, uh, uh, Zakawi, um, uh, most prominently, who was um, the father of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, so the predecessor of ISIS. Um, you have um, two people who are still alive and present in, uh, in Jordan. Uh, one is um, uh, the Salafi preacher al Makdisi, who was very influential, who also educated um, uh, Zakawi. And you have Abu Qatada al Falasini. What is the situation uh, regarding uh, ISIS now? We have uh, an estimated 2,000 Jordanian fighters uh, now in Syria and in Iraq. But of course, um, I mean, this estimate is, uh, is very hard um, uh, uh, to figure out. Uh, this is a rough estimate, but it could be, could be less, could be much more. Then um, um, in Jordan, you have anything ranging from sleeper cells to outright supporters and quiet sympathizers of, um, of ISIS. However, the security apparatus is very strong and is very well informed of, um, uh, of, um, of these groups in, in, jo in Jordan and keeps a very tight record. And many people have been imprisoned for supporting or promoting terrorist activities. But um, it is very important um, to note that the vast majority of uh, the Jordanian um, uh, population uh, opposes ISIS and um, is viewing its rise with um, skepticism and, uh, and concern. A turning point or a slight turning point was in September uh, 2014 uh, when Jordan joined uh, the US-led coalition against ISIS and many Jordanians found themselves in a dilemma. On the one hand, they clearly didn't want um, uh, the Islamic State in, in Jordan. On the other hand, it was very difficult for them to accept that their government was joining in a, a US-led coalition to kill uh, their Sunni, uh, Sunni brothers. So um, uh, they found themselves in a dilemma. And um, uh, in September, just after the joining of the uh, coalition, I went to the southern city of uh, Ma'an. Ma'an, many of you may, might have heard in uh, this context, it is it has been um, portrayed in the media as a hub for uh, ISIS in Jordan, which is not always justified. I think there has been a lot of exaggeration in this uh, regard. Well, um, after the um, launch of the coalition in September, I went to this city of Ma'an and, um, uh, and talked to many people about ISIS. And um, uh, they told me, um, if I have to choose between my government, who is all of a sudden aligning with Westerners to kill my Sunni brothers in uh, our neighboring countries and ISIS, I am tending towards ISIS. And this I found um, of great concern. And um, uh, this changed uh, in February when uh, the video of the execution of the Jordanian pilot Moaz um, al kasazbe was released. Within hours, you could see the country turn around completely. All of a sudden, uh, all Jordanians were behind um, uh, the government and supported the airstrikes against ISIS uh, in Syria. And um, the government um, uh, played it very cleverly, uh, rode on this um, uh, wave and, um, uh, and joined uh, uh, Jordanians together uh, uh, to an anti-ISIS uh, coalition. Um, what has been the impact of ISIS uh, in Jordan? In general, you can say uh, that um, uh, the rise of ISIS has uh, contributed to the aggravation of many of Jordan's problems that were already um, pre-existing, that were, for example, caused by the conflict uh, in Iraq and in, uh, in, in Syria. Uh, for example, um, uh, Jordan has been a recipient of many, many refugees, and this actually <coughs> dates uh, back decades. Uh, Jordan is um, the home country to many Palestinian uh, refugees, has um, received many, many um, Iraqi refugees during uh, the wars, and now um, is home to um, uh, about 700,000 registered, UN-registered Syrian 
refugees. So this is an enormous um, uh, challenge for such a small country as Jordan. Then, of course, um, uh, Jordan has um, a very um, weak economy. Uh, Jordan is a large recipient of uh, foreign funds from the US, from the Gulf, from Saudi Arabia. And um, uh, this weak economy is now further weakened by uh, transfer routes being cut off. Um, Syria is no longer uh, passable for, for trucks and, uh, and Iraq. So this um, is causing um, a lot of um, problems. Uh, also, um, the country's energy supply, it is largely um, dependent on, uh, on foreign energy supply, has been cut off. And uh, at the moment, um, we have a huge controversy in Jordan regarding a potential gas deal between uh, Jordan and Israel, which is very controversial in, um, uh, in, uh, in the population, um, which has uh, a lot of issues with uh, um, the close ties uh, Jordan has to Israel. Also, um, uh, Jordan still has nuclear plans. Uh, um, it uh, is attempting to build a nuclear facility uh, for electricity generation in, in Jordan and is um, in this um, regard supported by Russia, which in my opinion is al also a move one has to consider carefully what aims does Russia have in supporting, uh, hugely financially supporting uh, such a um, plan in Jordan. So um, uh, these are um, issues that um, Jordan has been having and which have been aggravated by the uh, rise of ISIS and the crises in the region in general. Uh, I mentioned in the beginning that um, Jordan is turning more towards a security logic. Um, we can see um, in the past two, two years that many freedoms have been limited. This um, uh, refers especially to the freedom of speech and to the press freedom. We have recently seen a couple of bans on um, uh, what journalists are, are allowed to uh, publish. For example, it is not allowed anymore to um, uh, publish articles on the armed forces, on the security apparatus. And there was a recent ban on reporting on um, an uh, attack which was supposedly done by uh, the Iranian-backed uh, Beit al-Maqdis in, in Jordan. And there have been a couple of arrests um, of uh, journalists, which is um, uh, quite shocking to the uh, journalistic community uh, in Jordan. And um, uh, you see a lot of um, self-censorship. People are uh, noticing um, uh, uh, the, the government attempts in this and are um, uh, not even publishing critical articles, but are, um, uh, um, are censoring them themselves. And um, this has greatly influenced the public uh, discourse. Um, Jordan also ended its moratorium on the death penalty uh, last December and um, uh, suddenly executed a number um, uh, of people, which by many was also seen as a signal <coughs> that now um, uh, a period of tolerance has ended and um, uh, there will be uh, tough consequences for, uh, for lawbreakers. Um, Jordan has a state security court and has um, uh, implemented a, uh, a strict law against uh, terrorist activities, which has also um, uh, caused great controversy in the country. Um, to, uh, uh, to conclude, will uh, Jordan remain stable? This is uh, always the uh, great question. Will Jordan remain the stable oasis is that it is at the moment? Regarding um, the um, uh, external borders, I'm very confident. Um, uh, Jordan has very strong allies and has um, uh, very strong partners who have um, interests in protecting the integrity of the Jordanian borders and will do everything in their power um, uh, to, to keep uh, the, the borders closed. Uh, and we've seen recent uh, reinforcement of the borders. But um, also um, uh, Israel uh, uh, recently announced plans to, uh, to build a wall uh, from uh, the south uh, of Jordan uh, to reinforce its border there and has um, created a new battalion also to, uh, to protect um, the border to, to Jordan, which is uh, quite telling in my opinion. Um, there have been rumors that um, Jordan is planning to create a buffer zone um, uh, on the Jordanian-Syrian uh, border. Uh, this has um, been refuted by both um, the Jordanian side and um, the US administration. Of course, um, the uh, Jordanian government would need the support of um, the U.S. administration to, uh, to create uh, such a buffer zone. 
Um, but um, I, I have been assured that the U.S. has no interest in creating uh, this uh, buffer zone, and it is also um, it would be um, a very controversial and risky step for Jordanians. And there, um, as soon as the rumors emerged, there um, were many um, people who spoke out against them. Uh, Jordan has um, uh, put a lot of effort in keeping its um, uh, its borders safe, but um, it is um, very outspoken against any invasion of um, Syrian territory and um, uh, is very set on not engaging uh, any soldiers in a ground war. Airstrikes um, are okay, but um, a, a ground war is off limits for, um, for Jordan, and the creation of a buffer zone might well be the first step towards uh, engaging the, the country in a ground war. Uh, so on the external side, I see a uh, little risk of IS um, uh, um, uh, uh, creating a dilemma for, uh, for Jordan. However, on the internal side, we have an enormous potential for um, a radicalization. Um, Jordan has um, a weak economy, as I, um, uh, as I mentioned, and um, we have uh, communities where a lot of um, uh, young men especially have uh, a weak education, have little perspectives in terms of employment, economic opportunities, and are very easy prey uh, to recruiters. Um, you cannot say that um, uh, ISIS recruitment is only um, uh, attracting poor people or um, people with a little education or a little economic perspectives. We have seen uh, people with PhDs and uh, very well off um, uh, from very well off families recruited for ISIS. Um, so, um, in addition to the eco uh, economic constraints that many people feel, it is certainly um, a search for identity as well and um, a, a, um, religious, a Sunni religious identity, which um, ISIS is very cleverly playing to at the moment. But um, uh, uh, Jordan has a huge potential for internal radicalization, and this, uh, for me, is uh, the major issue that, um, uh, that we need to, to keep in mind. Also, we have had um, uh, young um, uh, Jordanians going to Syria for jihad and coming back very frightened, very disillusioned, and then um, being imprisoned. And um, uh, the question is if this is a, a clever strategy or if this is a step to further uh, radicalization, because we have seen that um, prison cells have been uh, veritable operation rooms um, for, for terror, uh, terrorist cells. So um, uh, it would be important to keep in mind how to de-radicalize uh, returning jihadis, people who have uh, turned their back on, um, uh, on ISIS, and not to further uh, radicalize uh, them. Uh, in this regard, also, um, uh, it would be advisable for uh, Western countries to think about extradition. Um, uh, a lot of countries have um, uh, been planning or have, um, have implemented the extradition of uh, terrorist suspects um, uh, to their home countries. Is it really advisable that um, uh, Western countries send back um, uh, terrorist suspects to the hotspots of, um, uh, um, uh, of terrorist activity? Uh, this is uh, another question uh, which is um, very relevant in my opinion. Um, one more thing that I would like to mention before um, I will come to a close is uh, the relationship uh, in Jordan between the government and the Muslim Brotherhood. While the Muslim Brotherhood has been facing a lot of much more difficult challenges in uh, neighboring countries, uh, Jordan has been uh, tolerant towards um, uh, the brother Brotherhood, but has, of course, um, uh, implemented um, uh, its system to keep it at bay. What we have um, seen uh, recently is um, that um, uh, there have been stricter uh, steps towards the Brotherhood. For example, um, one of the key leaders of the Jordanian Brotherhood, uh, Zaki Baner Sheikh, was arrested last year and was sentenced to one, ha one and a half years in prison for um, criticizing the um, Emirates on his Facebook page. And um, according to Jordanian legislation, it is not only forbidden to um, criticize the kingdom itself, but also um, uh, its allies. And on this ground, he was, uh, he was sentenced. And um, 
in my opinion, this is a very risky step because um, by um, uh, sentencing a key uh, leader of the uh, Jordanian Brotherhood, um, the government risks alienating uh, moderate Islamists and radicalizing um, them uh, further. We also see um, a rift in the uh, Muslim Brotherhood. There has been a traditional division between uh, the more um, reform-oriented Dovs and the more conservative Hawks. But we've recently um, uh, seen the creation of a reform movement called Zamzam. And the latest development is that a small group of people have officially registered um, the Muslim Brotherhood in Jordan, which is now creating a legal ent uh, entity challenging um, uh, the Brotherhood uh, to its funds and assets uh, in Jordan. This has been um, at least mildly supported by the government. Uh, in my opinion, this is um, a very risky move because the Brotherhood has been a platform for moderate Islamists. By um, uh, destroying or um, uh, dissecting this platform, um, we create further um, opportunities for radicalization and alienation of moderate Islamists. I will <laughs> come to a close now, and I'm looking forward to the discussion and to your questions. Thank, thank you, Anya. Uh, thank you, um, Henri. Um, and thank you to the Wilson Center for hosting this. Congratulations on your appointment. Um, it's um, after Anya's very comprehensive uh, presentation. I hope there's something left for me to say. Um, you know, Jordan has really defied the odds since 1946. I think you could s safely say there's maybe a graveyard full of Middle East policy think tank analysts in Washington, full of uh, of, of analysts who predicted the the demise of Jordan uh, since 46. Um, but it's relatively stable. It looks great considering the neighborhood. Um, sure, they have problems with tourism, with trade, with energy. Um, I just wrote a piece, however, for, for the Institute about uh, what the IMF and the World Bank are saying about Jordan's economy. They're quite bullish. They're, they're quite optimistic about uh, what has been done, the, the, the macro uh, picture. It's a key uh, U.S. ally in the region. Uh, but of course, it's frequently taken for granted because we're not seeing the kind of problems there that we see elsewhere. But it shouldn't be. The kingdom is surrounded by threats. It has Sunni jihadi threats. It has Shiite militant threats. Um, and it has domestic concerns. We, we heard from Anya about the Herak, this domestic foment uh, that peaked in, uh, in November 2012. Uh, but paradoxically, I think the regional instability, um, what's going on in the region, has caused Jordanians to say, basically, uh, we're not going to go out. We don't want what's happening in Syria. We don't want Egypt. Um, we may be less than satisfied with the administration of our country. We may want things to change, but we're not willing to endure this type of chaos. And this has uh, paradoxically stabilized the country. Um, before talking about the current events, I think it's important to review what Jordan looked like before uh, the killing of Kasasbe in February. It was a very different environment. Um, uh, and I think it's critical to understanding this if you even want to mention the idea of a buffer zone. Uh, prior to Kasasbe, you had a growing opposition, as we heard, to U.S. military presence in Jordan. The leading hashtag in the kingdom was, this is not our war. There was a series of, of statements put out by ad hoc and, and permanent groups a letter from members of tribes calling American troops, uh, uniformed troops on Jordanian soil, quote unquote, a legitimate target. Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood um, issued a, a statement calling it a, an American campaign against uh, ISIS in, um, in Syria. Uh, you had groups like Tayyar al-Shabi al Ordoni, um, groups of religious figures issuing statements saying that you can't cooperate. You had Abu Sayyaf, Mohammed Shalabi, um, who termed the Jordanian involvement with the coalition, quote unquote, the beginning of the end of the Hashemite regime. Um, th most of this is driven by the sympathy in the kingdom for Sunnis and the plight of Sunnis in Syria. And it's not surprising, right? You've had to date 300,000, mostly Sunnis, being killed by a nominally Shiite regime in Damascus. It's an evocative issue. So they had polling in September 2014 by the Center for Strategic Studies at the University of Jordan in which only 62% of Jordanians said ISIS was a terrorist organization. Right? Only 31% said the Al-Qaeda affiliate Jabhat al-Nusra was a terrorist organization. 
And just 44% of Jordanians said that Al-Qaeda was a terrorist organization, right? And I, I don't, I'm not saying that Jordanians like Al-Qaeda, like ISIS, like Jabhat al-Nusra. What I'm saying is they viewed these groups as effective fighting force against the anomaly Shiite Assad regime. Well, <coughs> you had an effect that goes back to 2005, the Amman hotel bombings, right? And I think Kasaspa effect was exactly the same so far. That's prior to November 2005, and the attack on three Amman hotels that killed 60 and wounded 115, 61% of Jordanians reported that they viewed Osama bin Laden favorably, right? After the bombing, support plummeted to 24%, and five years later, it bottomed out at 13%. Kasaspa changed everything in Jordan, right? The question is, for how long, right? Will it endure? Now, let's look at border security, right? You have um, a good and excellent intelligence service in Jordan. Uh, they are active. They are proactive. Um, we can talk about, uh, during Q&A, about their, their methodology, about whether this is something that we can live with. Um, but overall, they are effective. <coughs> you have a, de a foreign threat, though, that's coming from Syria, from Iraq. Uh, in July 2014, after the, the fall of Mosul to ISIS, ISIS troops started moving toward Rutba on the border in Iraq. Jordan dispatched four F-16s. They bombed this ISIS convoy on the Iraqi side of the border. Right? Jordan is proactive about its defense. You've had along the, Sir along the Syria border, if you read the Jordanian press, every couple days there are reports of skirmishes, whether these are people who are drug trafficking or insurgents who are trying to cross the border into Jordan with uh, engagements between Jordanian troops and ISIS or Jabhat al-Nusra or others. Um, and the Jordanians are successful at defending their borders. In 2013, Jordan spent 1.3 billion, nearly 13% of its budget on internal or homeland security and national defense. That's a large portion of its budget. The U.S. has supplemented Jordan's border security program. They've been increased the baseline of FMF and economic support to a billion dollars a year. They just signed a three-year memorandum of understanding. It was already at a billion. My, I suspect that it will be well over a billion when, by the time you count everything up, including supplementals and other assistance. Jordan has also, over the years, heavily invested in border security. C4, ISR, communications, computers, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance. Um, uh, the military also, I think it's most important to point out, is cohesive. It's loyal, and it's relatively well-trained. This is not the Iraqi army. It's not going to dissolve when ISIS comes to the border. But ideology, at the end of the day, traverses borders, right? This is not a problem of an ISIS invasion of, of the kingdom. Uh, this is a problem of ISIS ideology traveling, traversing borders. What we hear about most is Mon. I visited Mon a couple times in the past couple of years. If you see the great mosque downtown in, in, in Mon, it's festooned with banners of, of people who have been martyred in Syria, um, you know, announcing the, 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 the martyrs' weddings. Um, you have Abu Sayyaf, you know, the, the jihadist recruiter running around in, in Man. Uh, there was no uh, state presence within the city limits for some time. Um, there's been historic problems with this town. Um, the, the police just recently returned. Um, they, the police headquarters have been getting shot up um, for years, unrelated, by the way, to ISIS and Jabhat al-Nusra. This is just dissatisfaction with the government. Uh, but this is nothing new for Mon, for, for people who follow Jordan. Um, you've had several pro-ISIS demonstrations. You have ISIS graffiti in downtown Mon. Um, the demonstrations have not been large numbers. Um, it's unclear to me whether this is actually a demonstration of real support for ISIS or expressions of dissatisfaction with the palace. Um, I think you can get away with it down in Mon. Uh, you know, that said, uh, there have been, you know, more than a couple dozen funerals of martyrs um, in Mon. Um, but it's my impression that the government's more concerned. Mon is three hours out of the capital, right? I think the government's more concerned about places like Salt, Rusefa, Zarqa, places that are, you know, an hour, hour and a half out of downtown Amman. This is home to Abu Muhammad Makdisi, uh, the, the spiritual guide of, 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 um, of Zarqawi. Um, what's happening in these places? And till now, I don't think there's a good sense of what's going on 
uh, in these locations. Um, there's no reliable statistics. The Jordanian Ministry of Interior says 1,300 foreign fighters um, have gone from Jordan to, to Syria. Um, but we often hear, and I think there's reason to believe there are higher estimates. I think uh, I've calculated about 250 um, uh, uh, killed in action of jihadis of uh, Jordanian origin. Um, so I, I think it's probably closer to 2,500, but who knows. Um, uh, two MPs' sons have now joined the jihad, right? Members of parliament, one killed in action in Aleppo, the other just recently reported. Um, Jordan's economy is doing well in a, in a macro sense, but it's very tough times for the poor. Subsidy re reduction, large pockets of unemployment. 57% uh, of, Jord of Jordanians recently polled see the economy is bad or very bad. Um, this is not good. There's other questions, right? We have 700,000 registered refugees, 700,000 registered Syrian refugees, probably closer to a million all told, not everybody is registered. Only 120,000 of those or so live in refugee camps. The rest live throughout Jordan. Um, what are their sympathies? Right? We hear oftentimes, Halaya Naima, the, the sleeper cells. Um, there's a large concern about this. What will be the impact of the crackdown on the Muslim Brotherhood in Jordan? The arrest of Zani Bakir or Shade, the confiscation of Muslim Brotherhood property, on support or movement toward Salafism in the kingdom. Uh, anecdotally, I've been going to Jordan since uh, 1988, and it looks more Salafi to me. I can't prove it. I don't think there's any reliable statistics. Uh, but to me, um, and maybe experts will disagree, there's a thin line between Salafi and Salafi jihadi. This worries me. It's a trend. So what of the buffer zone? Jordanian intelligence has been reportedly operating north of the border in Syria for several years. In terms, they're looking for situational awareness, a knowledge on the ground. Um, like I said, Jordan's intelligence networks are very good, particularly in the south. They talk all the time about their tribal connections. Um, the fall of Palmyra, Palmyra Tadmor, 240 kilometers away or so from the Jordanian border, changed the debate slightly about wh whether Jordan had to be more proactive about its defense um, and what to do in the south of Syria. You recall back in 1990, Naif al-Qadi, the Minister of Interior of, of Jordan at the time, um, during the movement, the mass movement of Iraqis into Jordan, said that Jordan would be providing humanitarian support on the Iraqi side of the border, right? Trying to not let all these Iraqis into the Now, this didn't hold, but the idea initially, or the stated policy, was to keep Jor I Iraqis on that side of the border. Um, the idea now is that Jordan is saturated with refugees. We see the refugee uh, flows slowing, and that's intentional on Jordan's part. Um, you have a few problems with this. One is domestic. Jordanians, I said before, Kasasba were protested against the Jordanian army being deployed abroad. Right? Some groups said this was against the Constitution. This is a country, a, an army that is constitutionally mandated to protect Jordan's borders. This is what the Muslim Brotherhood said. This is what other people said in the kingdom as well. Um, beyond that, there's a fear, there's a concern. Certainly, we saw what happened with one casualty, Muadha Kasasba. Right? What would happen if you had Jordanian troops on the other side of the, bargain, uh, the border? These people would be targeted uh, by Jabhat al-Nusra and by ISIS as well. Right? You would have larger numbers of Jordanian casualties. The second problem is the Assad regime. Right? So in addition to being targeted by Jabhat al-Nusra and ISIS, right, having casualties, the Jordanians would also be targeted by the ISIS, by, uh, by the Assad regime in South Syria. Right? Hit from all sides. Uh, and, of course, the Iranians, who are on the border as well. Um, there's much that the Assad regime could do to make things a lot more complicated for Jordan that they have not done yet. Right? Jordan uh, is helping to train, reportedly, uh, Syrian uh, opposition forces. Maybe they trained some of the 60 that have been trained, <laughs> reportedly, so far. Um, you know, this doesn't concern the Assad regime, right? nor do the airstrikes that are being launched from Jordanian territory. In fact, the Assad regime loves this. That, that the West is going out and whacking ISIS. Um, but they can make more things complicated. If they had an offensive in the South, what would happen to all the people who are living in the South of Syria right now? Right? You could see a mass immigration, migration of Syrians, of refugees coming across the border into to Jordan. It's taken now four years to get to a million. Right? And the Assad regime hasn't even really come South. Right? 
What if the, the Assad regime destroyed the power plants in Dera, right? The people in the south no longer have water or energy, electricity, right? That would send a massive number of people south. And then, of course, what we haven't seen to date, but is no doubt in the works, is Assad supported terrorism in the kingdom, right? We saw it a lot in, uh, after the invasion of Iraq. We saw the Jayusi cell that planned uh, its operations in Damascus crossed uh, into Jordan, planned to launch a chemical bomb in Amman to kill 100,000 people. Th these people crossed the border with the permission of the regime, right? There were other Zarqawi operations. Um, the, the Assad regime supported um, Al-Qaeda, et cetera. We can talk about this later. Um, but they can do a lot of damage to the kingdom. They chose them not to do so, so far, and they will. Which brings me to the recent reports of the dual Iraqi-Norwegian national arrested in Amman, accused of being an oper operative for the Al-Quds forces, um, who was re reportedly planning uh, or plotting um, planting roadside bombs in northern Jordan, maybe other nefarious activities. Um, this, um, uh, you know, maybe the timing of this is suspect. Um, you know, he was arrested maybe some time ago. The Jordanians announced this right before the signing of the deal. But that doesn't change the equation. I, I don't think there's any reason to doubt that this guy was affiliated in some way with the Iranians. Back in March, Qasem Soleimani, the commander of Iran's Quds forces, publicly stated his country's interest in promoting the Islamic Revolution in Jordan. Right? Um, now, by the way, Qasem Soleimani has just been delisted. Um, is going to be taken off the list in the latest nuclear deal agreement as a, as a terrorist um, or a proliferation concern uh, designated as such. Um, but basically, the pro-West orientation at the end of the day, the U.S. orientation of the kingdom, makes Jordan a target not only of Sunni jihadists like ISIS and Jabhat al-Nusra, but also of Iran. And my concern is not, once again, of ISIS coming across the border necessarily. It's of the ideology traveling across the border. Um, and I don't think, no matter how good the Jordanian intelligence is, um, that they're going to have a 100% record on this. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, David. And thank you for bringing the Iran um, question into your presentation. Uh, since we're running short on time, let me dispense with my questions, and I'll open it up to the, um, the audience. Please identify yourself and ask a brief question, Marina. Thank you. Uh, you both have talked about the spreading of, a, of the ideology, the danger of radicalization. Is there a difference in the sense between the two elements of the Jordanian population, the Palestinian versus the, the tribes, if I want to put, if I can put it that way? Is, is one group more su susceptible than the other? I mean, you or me first? Um. Listen, I think um, I'll start. Um, this is a great question. I've asked it my, myself. I think the Jordanian intelligence thinks that it's slightly in the favor of the Palestinians. A lot of the, the leadership of Jebet the Nusra in the south um, had been of Palestinian origin, uh, but it's um, uh, Jordanian Palestinian origin. But I, I think that it's pretty close. And you've had a lot of high profile um, tribal members um, joining the jihad next door. Um, you know, it's an, it's an interesting question, and, uh, and one that I don't think we're going to have any certainty of, but one that I think my sense is, uh, is relatively balanced the equation. Uh, r related, uh, or not necessarily related to this, but also another interesting question I frequently ask, um, is whether there are more sympathies um, or whether the sympathies are changing in Jordan for those who would support the going to the jihad from Jebet the Nusra to ISIS. And early on, there was very little support for ISIS in the kingdom. Then you started to see, I think, a shift more toward ISIS, just basically like based on the success of the group. Um, but I don't know whether Kasasba has changed that or slowed that down. Um, you know, I, I thought, by the way, back to the first question really briefly, I thought initially that because of the divisions within the Muslim Brotherhood, in Jordan, and because of the views of the tribes toward, uh, toward some Palestinians, um, that there would be um, a bigger group of tribal origin, East Bank or origin, uh, Jordanians who are more sympathetic to the Salafi movement, 
because the Jordanian Muslim Brotherhood had basically been taken over by the pro Hamas, you know, with Zaki Bani Rashid and uh, Hamam Said, that these guys were very aligned with the, you know, the Palestinian cause, with Hamas, and that if you were a tribal origin Jordanian, that you might find Salafism more appealing because he didn't want to go to the Brotherhood. Um, I wrote that initially. I suspected it. I don't know if there's any proof for that. Maybe if I can add on uh, just a little bit. Um, I think um, this is a very um, uh, interesting question also with regard to the city of uh, Ma'an, which has been um, heavily de discussed. We've heard um, that um, uh, uh, there is um, um, uh, regular confrontations with the police. There have been uh, a lot of, um, uh, well, expressions of sympathy towards ISIS. But I would say um, this is not necessarily um, uh, a support, a, genu a genuine support for ISIS. I think this is oftentimes a rattling of the gun uh, to show the, uh, the government uh, uh, their uh, discontent. Ma'an is a strongly tribally influenced uh, 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 region, and, uh, and this is um, one of the reasons uh, why I think um, that ISIS does have some supporters there, but um, uh, that the um, uh, more dangerous spot is Zakka, which is a largely Palestinian-influenced uh, uh, city. And you can see with um, the two uh, prominent uh, leaders at the moment, Maktisi and uh, Qatar, that they are both uh, uh, Jordanian and Palestinian. And um, the, the cr recruiting in, in Zakka is uh, undoubtedly much um, uh, more successful uh, than in any other city in, uh, in Jordan. Hi, uh, Phil Schrafer, retired international health care worker. Uh, I guess a question uh, pr uh, primarily to Anja, but, but to both panelists. Um, Saudi Arabia, conspiracy th theories. Uh, since Saudi Arabia has always, is a member of the coalition, however, has some very ra radical Wahhabi elements who certainly supported the Taliban, uh, what are the thinking that they're supporting, supporting the Islamic State? What's, what's the conspiracy theory, and what do you think of that, uh, that idea? Thank you. Well, um, I, I think very little of these uh, conspiracy theories in, uh, in general. Um, I think uh, Saudi Arabia is a very uh, tricky case and uh, has uh, been a riddle to, to many uh, to researchers. Um, uh, of course, there is always uh, the ongoing uh, debate about um, uh, Saudi um, support for uh, a diverse uh, terrorist group about um, its uh, efforts to stop terrorist financing. Um, there has been proof that um, Saudi individuals have supported uh, um, uh, several uh, um, uh, terrorist movements, um, whether with the support of the government or not. Um, so um, uh, this is not an easy uh, question to answer. Uh, Saudi Arabia is a very close ally um, uh, of Jordan, um, but um, you could see that in uh, uh, in recent weeks um, there have uh, there has been some uh, disenchantment. For example, um, uh, the foreign minister um, uh, of Jordan uh, has paid a visit to uh, Tehran, and um, the uh, head of the Iranian um, uh, secret service uh, went to visit uh, Amman, and the Saudis were not happy about this. Uh, the uh, uh, Jordanian king has criticized in uh, close meetings um, the Saudi um, uh, actions in Yemen and has called this highly uh, dangerous, uh, their um, uh, actions there. So um, uh, this is um, a, a tricky um, uh, relationship. Um, I think um, it's not easily answered. Thank you. Uh, my name is Asal. I'm the Deputy Chief of Mission at the Embassy of Jordan here in Washington, D.C. I would like to thank you for hosting this event. And uh, if I may, I would like to briefly elaborate on some of the issues very briefly. <laughs> Two minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so basically, like the speaker said, the problem in Jordan is economic, it's not security, it's not political. Uh, we are a country based on institutions and uh, our security apparatus, uh, apparatus, apparatus, sorry, as you mentioned, is very strong and very vigilant. Despite all the difficulties we are facing, the government is really focusing on investment and we recently hosted the World Economic Forum and launched <coughs> several grand projects to reinvigorate the economy and to develop the governorates and to create more employment opportunities, including actually in Man. We, uh, we launched a huge project there for renew renew renewable energy. 
Um, I also want to elaborate on the point of uh, terrorism. The government actually launched a very comprehensive and far-reaching uh, counter-terrorism strategy recently, which is multi-pronged. It focuses on youth, universities, mosques, and all that. So it's true there is sympathy to ISIS in Jordan, and there are fighters from Jordan going to fight with this misguided organization, but this is the exception and not the norm. We are a very tolerant people and very pragmatic. Um, also on Ma'an, actually the problem is Ma'an is uh, basically being instigated by a band of outlaws and criminals. The, statics, the statistics and investigations I did take a look at and read uh, proves that many of these people who are taking advantage of some sympathy to ISIS, they're using it to cover many of the illicit activities they practice there. And the government is investing heavily in developing Ma'an and creating economic development and projects there. 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, on the buffer zone, actually, there is no intention by the Jordanian government to create this buffer zone. What's happening is we uh, started a vetting process for Syrian refugees in cooperation with the UNHCR and other international organizations which means it takes a bit longer for Syrian refugees to enter Jordan and be registered, but we're continuing this process and it's going very well. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. <laughs> uh, lead in the back, and then. Um, Nicole from the International Center for Religion and Diplomacy. I actually have two questions. Um, they're both short, one for each of you. Um, for Anya, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about your foundation's youth programs in Jordan, and particularly whether there's been intercultural exchange included in that, and um, whether they address these issues of radicalization. And then um, for David, my question is, you touched a little bit on um, refugee sympathies, but I'm wondering if you could just go into that a little bit deeper. Thank you. I will uh, start on the uh, youth programs, and thank, thank you very much for um, asking. Um, we have been working uh, for several years um, uh, with a program called uh, Young Leaders Jordan, and uh, what we do is at the beginning of each year, we select uh, 120 uh, young people aged between 18 and 25 from all over the country. Um, uh, what we do is um, to have a fairly low uh, entry barrier um, uh, in terms of um, uh, experience or um, formal um, education. What we do is um, um, we provide exclusively um, uh, Arabic uh, training on uh, politics, on social policy, on economics, and on soft skills. Our aim is um, to educate these young people um, uh, to become uh, community leaders and to implement uh, uh, programs in their uh, communities. And this um, program has been running now for four or five years, and we are now seeing uh, the, the fruit of this um, because uh, several um, uh, young people have um, uh, launched initiatives in their communities. For example, in Ma'an, uh, a young man has created a community theater against uh, violence which is very um, uh, successful. And in Karak, um, uh, a young man has started um, awareness uh, workshops on uh, um, the benefits of renewable energy, which is um, uh, not always um, uh, uh, an easy topic uh, in Jordan. So um, uh, this is uh, actually one of my, my favorite uh, programs, which we, we do in Jordan, because you have seen uh, a decline in the educational system. And you see that many of these young people are extremely uh, talented and motivated, but have suffered from uh, a lack of um, education and uh, um, uh, are very uh, grateful for these um, uh, opportunities outside their uh, school and university education. Thank you. And Nicole, that's a good question. You know, I, I spoke to somebody pretty recently who said they were interested in doing some polling of the Syrian refugees. Um, I have not seen that. I've been up to Zatari a couple times and met some other Syrian refugees throughout the country. Um, and, and I'm really unaware, I, I don't think I could generalize what their, what their views are. I think most of them are just really happy to be out of Syria right now um, and wondering when they'll be able to get back home, if ever. Um, the, the problem, of course, is if, if you follow you know, just what the, the track record is, if people stay somewhere more than 12 years, they stay there forever. And so that means Jordan gets a million more people um, you know, at a minimum. Uh, there's nowhere to go back to, right? You're going to have this war go on for some time. Meanwhile, I think the issue that, that I'm trying to follow is, you know, Jordan is a remarkably hospitable country for refugees. 
um, whether these be Palestinian, Iraqi. Um, for me, I think this is a little bit different because of, um, of the economic dislocation that some of these Syrians are going to cause. Um, we see it already. Um, you have, according to official records, something like 11 percent, 12 percent unemployment, um, which is lower than I think most people who follow the situation um, believe that it is, in part because a lot of people have left the job market because they can't get jobs. Um, we know the story, right? Um, you have, like I said, about 800,000 of these Syrians who for a couple of years now have been getting a basket of goods and subsidies, cash relief from UNHCR. Now that's running out. Um, they're, they don't have any money anymore. Uh, but these people have to go out and live off the land. And so what they do is they get jobs and they're willing to work for less than Jordanians are working for. Uh, so in, in some cases you read about, they're taking Jordanian jobs or you can afford to hire two Syrians for one Jordanian um, in places like restaurants. If you go to a, a coffee shop, the guy uh, you know, giving you coal on your, your shisha might be a, might be a Syrian. Um, they're driving up rents because they're, get, they're taking apartments and they're opening businesses. And for those of you who follow the Middle East, um, what is the reputation of Syrian businessmen in the Middle East? Right? They have an amazing reputation as being the sharpest business people in the region. Um, they're going to do quite well in Jordan, um, but there's going to be some backlash. Now, we, I've only seen one particular case uh, where you've had sort of a, a huge amount of backlash, and that wasn't economically related. It was uh, one particular event in Tafila where somebody from uh, of Syrian origin with a refugee killed a member of a tribe in Tafila and 700 Syrians were summarily put on a truck and driven out of town. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen, you know, anytime soon elsewhere in the kingdom, but it's something to look for. My name is Tom Getman. I'm an NGO executive. And UNHCR says that hundreds of thousands of Syrian children have been without education for as long as three years. And uh, I'm taking 20 people in September to look at some of the situations in that regard. Is there any chance that a third session of schools could be added with Syrian teachers yeah. to educate these kids? And what would it take for the rest of us to raise the money to do it? Well, um, as uh, David mentioned before, um, the vast majority of refugees uh, do not live in uh, refugee camps. Um, the largest camp, uh, Zateri, is actually uh, uh, very well organized and has been serving as a back pr uh, best practice model for, for example, African uh, refugee camps. But the communities are helplessly um, uh, overflown by, uh, by refugees, and um, uh, they are working in shifts in, uh, in the schools and uh, hospitals and other infrastructure has just been uh, on overload. So um, the Jordanians do are doing everything they can, but at some point I think the infrastructure is just um, uh, meeting uh, its end. So I see very um, uh, little um, uh, short-term um, uh, perspectives on schooling these children, but I think it is um, uh, urgently necessary for um, international action to take uh, place there and uh, to support um, uh, the Jordanian communities in, in this regard. Oh, yes, yes, yes. They are a lost and very dangerous generation. Um, just one point on that. You know, uh, it's, it's harder outside the camps, obviously, to, to imagine the third shift, even just the location where you'd put these people. But um, uh, within the camp, within Zatari, they're now exploring and thinking of implementing a plan to get, um, to link the assistance to families. You know, you collect your assistance, but your kid has to have attended school to get your, your basket of assistance. You can make sure that kids are going to go to school if they're not going to eat if they don't. And they're thinking about doing that right now. Uh, I, before I come to, to another question from the inside, we have an overflow room, and I have some questions from that too, so I would like to take at least one of them. Uh, Anya, uh, this is for you. Can you elaborate on the issue of Western extradition? Are you saying that Western countries should uh, not extradite their citizens, or extradite their citizens and not let them stay in Jordanian prisons? Well, I think it's um, uh, an issue to very carefully um, uh, consider. If uh, a Western country has um, uh, the chance to um, uh, to keep um, a terrorist uh, suspect, 
or um, uh, even a convicted terrorist uh, in a safe location, I think this is much preferable than to extradite uh, this person at high cost, If uh, what we saw, for example, with uh, Abu Qatada from Britain, um, uh, to the hotspot, where this person can then maybe um, uh, even reinforce um, uh, terrorist activities right in the spot. This lady over here. Thank you. Uh, would you mind, and this question is for the both, both speakers, uh, please discuss how the availability or lack thereof of water, electricity, or food may increase the propensity for Jordans and Jordanians and refugees to uh, become radicalized. David, do you want to go ahead? Or? You want to go first? Yeah. So, uh, <coughs> you know, um, water is a problem, but I think um, I think it's not insurmountable. It become it's in short supply certainly, but they're getting some help from their their neighbor. Israel is uh, more in, uh, very self sufficient really with the desal and the reuse of brown water, uh, and they're doing quite well in providing Jordan with a lot more water um, than is required. But the summer than is required for Israel and required by the treaty. Um, but the summer is always a tough time uh, in the kingdom. And part of it is, uh, I think, um, you know, relative deprivation. Okay, people. Um, when they get water, they they fill up their bathtubs or fill up their uh, their their cisterns or whatnot. Um, because if they use it again during the week, it comes out you know brackish perhaps, or or they don't get it. Um, but they also see in the paper, you know, uh, pictures of Jordanian officials going to Marbella or whatnot on their yachts, and it, you know it becomes you know that in the past has been you know something that's not um, that's not been um, been great. I don't know whether there is going to be this sort of food insecurity that um, that drives people toward radicalization. But I think that um, because I think there's enough, probably enough, of a safety net, um, and the government is making great efforts in that regard. But I I do think that um, the lack of employment opportunities. Um, you know, is really going to be a, a bigger problem. That the kingdom um, has ambitious plans to create hundreds of thousands of jobs by 2025, and that it's not going to be able to do that. Um, and these people, the people that are living in the kingdom, whether they be Jordanian origin or Syrian origin, just aren't going to be able to find any work. And that that's going to be the biggest problem. Maybe I can just uh, add on that um, uh, Jordan is currently um, uh, um, discussing a reform of the labor law to allow um, more channels for Syrians into formal um, uh, employment because at the moment Syrians uh, are largely um, active in the informal uh, sectors and are actu actually um, pushing b uh, out um, uh, migrant workers, for example, Egyptians, out of their uh, jobs much more than uh, Jordanians. But, you know, one more thing. Uh, there's a big debate right now, or maybe among people like me, anyway. Um, <laughs> it's not, maybe not a big debate. Um, <laughs> a very small debate in my mind uh, between myself um, about whether Jordan is graduating too many people from college. Um, that you know they have this advanced private university system that's going, and this is a, a subject debate actually in the kingdom right now about what the opportunities are for people to get out of college. Is it worse to have, you know, they don't have a very advanced vocational training system, and people get out of university, and uh, you had, you know, I think I wrote something about this recently, you had, you know, hundreds of thousands of people apply for, you know, 60 jobs in the government last year, or something ridiculous like that. I think I've got the statistic in my last paper. You have a, a very high percentage of college grads that can't get work that is appropriate, and this, I think, is incredibly dangerous as well, because you know, these radicalization isn't only from, you know, it's not poverty, right? It's frustration. One last question, the gentleman over there. Hi, um, Eddie from the Middle East Institute. Um, thank you for a very comprehensive presentation. Uh, I actually just finished a co-authored article on this topic and drew similar conclusions, so I feel vindicated. Uh, my question is about um, what you envision from the risk of extremism within Jordan. Are you w more worried about organized attacks from cells? Are you more worried about lone wolves, which are p harder to pick up um, from the intelligence services? And you mentioned the risk of Zarqa because it's close to Amman, 
but I also worry about mine because it's close to Petra and it's a soft target. And what do you see as the biggest risk right now? Uh, let me just add uh, to that a question from the last question from the, uh, the overflow room. And there are two questions which basic, basically are the same um, in terms of what is the worst case scenario for global mm -hmm. tea. Well, um, uh, excellent question. Um, I, th uh, um, I think the lone wolf uh, phenomenon is much more um, uh, dangerous uh, to Jordan than to uh, than uh, organized cells because, um, as you said, um, uh, they are easier to track for the uh, security uh, apparatus, which is very uh, competent. And there actually have been fatwas um, uh, instigating uh, uh, lone wolf uh, attacks. So I think this uh, uh, this is uh, plausible. Um, I would like to add on uh, to something that um, uh, David mentioned before. Um, uh, he said that um, uh, he's uh, seeing Jordan as more and more Salafi, and that he's seeing a thin line between uh, Salafi and Salafi jihadi. I would um, uh, disagree with that. Um, I, um, I think that there are many different categories um, of uh, Salafism, and uh, only the most extreme form is uh, the jihadi Salafist. And um, uh, the traditional Salafist is uh, opposed to, um, uh, to violence and to um, uh, uh, political in, uh, involvement. So um, I think um, uh, you have to look very closely, and um, uh, in my opinion, it is a smart move um, uh, to uh, search for dialogue with uh, moderate uh, conservative uh, Salafis who are opposed to violence, because this could be uh, a channel um, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to moderation and to, uh, to um, integrate them into a dialogue on how to prevent further radicalization and to counter uh, jihadi Salafism. And I, I agree with the last point about dialogue between the government and the Salafis. I think that's worked. Um, very well for the Sisi regime in Egypt. They've managed to split the Salafis away from the Brotherhood and they've co-opted them into the, into the regime. Um, I think that, um, that there is a, a, a huge majority of the Salafis who are quietist, who don't want to participate in politics in Jordan um, and throughout the region. Um, regarding the terrorist cells, um, <coughs> you know, thinking back to even the Amman hotel bombings, um, you know, no matter how good you are, and Jordan's intelligence service is excellent, and they work very closely with the United States, with the Israelis, others. Um, some of these people are going to get through. Um, you know, the people like Sajida, you know, the cell that did the Amman hotel bombing, Sajida, the woman who, uh, Rashawi, the woman who was executed after the Qasasba burning, um, she and her you know, nominal husband, who got across the Iraqi border, I think they had gotten across because they said they were coming for um, in vitro treatment. Uh, in Jordan. Um, you know, it's very hard to stop everything. Um, but I think that the traditional list of, you know, targets for these people um, remains. These are Western targets. Uh, these are uh, government security uh, targets. Um, you know, uh, the, the Muhabrad headquarters, any Western embassy in the kingdom, and any tourist spot. The goal at the end of the day is to undermine stability in the kingdom, and part of the way you do that is not only by atta attacking the allies of the kingdom, but by undermining the economy go by going after tourism. Um, whether these are lone wolves or, or cells, I, I think there's a very serious threat. Um, you know, Jordan is doing everything it can, but I, I think ultimately we're going to see you know, a return to the bad old days you know, following the Iraq invasion, where you have um, more and more cells being disrupted, um, and some regrettably succeeding. On that note, uh, thank you very much. Please join me in, in thanking. The